it has to be a compelling vision. It's got to have something that has the power to pull you, not something you have to push yourself to do. Those are two different kinds of motivation. Push requires willpower, and willpower never lasts. What will last is pull. Having something so exciting, so attractive, so something you desire so much that you have a hard time going to sleep at night and you get so up early in the morning to a rocket and take it to the next level. That's what you're looking to create. And that isn't easy to get. But one of the reasons we do seminars and events, we say, you know, why do that? Why isn't, why not just read a book or something? Is because when you get an environment where you're with people that are being put in a peak state, like when you're going to a sporting event, if you watch a sporting event at home, it might have a certain level of excitement. But when you're in a stadium with 50,000 people, suddenly it has a whole different level of intensity. And we feel that. And the bottom line of our follow through comes down to our emotional intensity. In a different state of mind, you're going to come up with a much better and a more exciting vision than if you're sitting on the couch going, okay, what are my new resolutions for this year? And you're doing it the morning after the new year has started and you're a little inebriated. <laughs> and the football game's on in the background. Probably not going to have the power of focus there. Probably not going to have the power of the energy to create something that's going to pull you for this year. And you got to do that. So it's got to be a vision that's compelling. Something that you know it's going to be a gift to make sure that it happens. And also, along with that compelling vision, you got to have strong enough reasons that you're going to follow through when the going gets tough. That's one of the biggest things missing for most people. They say, oh, this is what I want to do. It's not very exciting. It's not very compelling. But most importantly, they don't have strong enough reasons to push themselves through what's going to be necessary to get that dream, to get that goal when the inevitable challenges come up, when you're starving hungry and you're trying to go on a diet, right? When you got no time and you're stressed out and you haven't worked out still and that's what you're supposed to do when the economy gets tight and what you thought you're going to do doesn't work and so you give up on the goal instead of finding another way to get there you don't let the fear take you over if you've got strong enough reasons those reasons can be positive or those reasons can also be negative they can be if i don't do this this is going to cost me and if i do do this this is what i'm going to gain in my life reasons come first answers come second if you get a compelling vision and you got strong enough reasons that will push you through the tough times, you're going to do things other people don't do. Instead of collapsing, even if you get off target, you won't go, oh, I blew it. You'll get right back on target, make the change, make things happen. And I know you've done this in many areas of your life. Just think about it again. I'm, I'm not teaching you something really new here today. I just want to remind you of what your soul knows. You got to change, you got to improve, and you got to go through a simple process fundamentally to make that progress. First step, vision that's compelling. Second step, make sure that there's strong enough reasons to follow through. Third step, you got to review it and feel it every day. I mean, anything. Have you ever had this happen in your life? Has there been anything in your life that you've ever wanted so badly? You were so desirous of it. You had such a hunger for it that you couldn't stop thinking about it. Could have been a career move. Could have been when you were a kid, a, a car. It could have been a relationship. It could have been anything, but you were obsessed. You wanted to make this happen. You wanted to attract this to your life. You, wanted, you just wanted something. And you didn't even know how to get it. But it was so compelling to you. You kept thinking about it every day, envisioning it, imagining it, feeling it. And then stuff happened. And suddenly you started to attract people or situations to your life. And it just came together. Like, you didn't even have a total plan. It was just that it was so a part of your focus with so much intensity and emotion so often that it sensitized you to notice anything that could get you there. There's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system. For short, we call it the RAS. That part of your brain determines what you notice in the world. And it's really important because when you set a goal, when you get really clear on a vision, and there's strong enough reasons, and you review it enough, and it becomes a part of you, that part of your brain says, anything that relates to this, I need to notice. It's like, did you ever buy a certain kind of car or maybe a, a certain outfit, and suddenly you see that car everywhere, or those outfits everywhere? You know, the cars were always around, but why do you see it now? Because your RAS knows this is important. This is part of my world now. Similarly, when you really get clear and it's compelling and you're reviewing it every day, got strong reasons and you're reviewing it every day and you're feeling it, the brain becomes incredibly acute at noticing anything to get you to move forward. And so that's the power of this. So, you know, what do people do with a New Year's resolution? They come up with something they kind of want. It's not a compelling vision. They don't really have strong enough reasons and they never review it again until they notice that they broke what they said they really want to have make happen because they didn't really resolve. If you resolve, you got the vision, it's compelling, you review it daily and you feel it, you envision it and you experience it. Simple as it sounds. Now, ultimately, what is this really about? Ultimately, if you're going to have lasting change in anything, you're really talking about just raising your standards. 
I mean, I always tell people, if you want to know how to change your life, I give it to you in three words, boring as it sounds, raise your standards. And what does that mean? Corny as it sounds, raise your standards. Well, thank you for the breakthrough thought, Tony. I'm glad I wasted my time watching this little email with you. But think about it. Lasting change is different than a goal. You don't always get your goals, but you always get your standards. Maybe it would help you is to think about it this way. I, I try to explain standards to people with a different set of words. Think of it as everybody in life gets their musts. They don't get their shoulds. Like, think about it. Most people have a list of shoulds, don't they? Don't you have a list of the shoulds, things you should do, you should follow through on. I, I should lose some weight. I should work out more. I should make more calls. I should respond more rapidly to my email, whatever, you know? I should get into the office earlier. I should be, you know, more confident. Whatever your should list is, people love to have their should list make, be met, but it's kind of like New Year's resolutions. If it does, it's really exciting, but if it doesn't, which is most of the time, eh, it's a little disappointing, but you kind of know it's not gonna happen. But when you decide something is a must for you, an absolute must, when you cut off any possible, you say, I'm gonna find the way, or I'm gonna make the way, human beings, when they resolve things, when they make a real resolution inside themselves, which is they raise the standard and they make it a must, they find the way. Think about it in your own life. Haven't you had some area of your life where you raise your standard and your life has never been the same? Maybe at one time in your life you smoked cigarettes or you did something and you did it for years and you kept trying to change it, trying to change it and kept telling yourself I should. And then one day something happened. Something just clicked you over. Something took you over that kind of tipping point. And inside yourself, you said, no more. And it was a very, very different experience, wasn't it? Something inside of you shifted. And what was a should became a must, and you've never gone back. Is there an area like that in your life you can think of? Again, did you ever smoke cigarettes? Did you ever eat a certain way, drink a certain form of alcohol, and then finally say, no more, and you just don't go back? And notice this, it doesn't really take any willpower anymore. Because somewhere when we make this click, when we make something a must, we attach ourselves to it it becomes part of our identity. And one thing I've learned in the last, gosh, 33 years of working with people from now over 100 countries, 4 million people, is human beings absolutely follow through on who they believe they are. If you say, said to me, well, I'm really gonna work hard to stop smoking, but you know, I've been a smoker my whole life and I'm, you know, I am a smoker. I know your days are numbered. You're gonna be back smoking cigarettes again because we all act consistent with who we believe we are. I tell people the strongest force in the whole human personality is this need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. If you define yourself as somebody who is really conservative, you're not gonna be crazy and act nuts unless you're really drunk or something and then you can say it's the alcohol when it's really just you finally getting permission to be yourself, the alcohol is your excuse. If you're a really crazy person, you act crazy, outrageous, playful. You don't act conservative because that's not who you are. Very often people say, well, I can't do that. I'm not that kind of person. And I always say to people, really, when did you define yourself? I mean, really, how many years ago did you come up with what you could and couldn't do in your life? How many years ago? Most people, if they really look at how they're living their life today, it's based on a set of standards, a set of beliefs that they made choices about 10, 20, 30 or more years ago. I mean, very often we made decisions in our youth or very young about what to believe, about what we were capable of, about who we are as a person, and that becomes the glass ceiling, if you will, that controls us. There's a, a corny metaphor, but it's true. I remember one time I was with my family at the circus and there was a person there and they had this big giant elephant and you look at this elephant and they take this little rope, put it around the elephant's neck and they drive this stake into the ground and I mean, you look at this and you know that elephant could rip down the entire tent with almost no effort. And yet the elephant doesn't struggle, doesn't try. Why? Because the elephant's conditioned. And they take that elephant, condition the elephant when it's a baby elephant. That's how they train him. When it's a little baby elephant and it doesn't have the power yet, they put a big rope around it and they drive this huge stake in the ground and the elephant fights and fights and fights. And one day, finally, that elephant decides, I'm not capable of pulling this out. And once that becomes the definition of an identity of anyone, an elephant in this case, they don't even try anymore. It's just who I am, that's how it is, that's just the way it is in my life. I'd like to ask you to take a look at any place you've got a limitation and ask yourself, when did I decide to accept that limitation? And you may not even see it as a limitation, you might see it as just that's who I am. But so often in our lives we've adapted to be a certain way so that we don't fail or so that people will like us or respect us, but it's not necessarily who we are. 
Joy comes when you're spontaneous. It's really hard to be truly happy when you're not being yourself. And most of us have no clue who we are. And so a big part of my work, if you've ever been to an event, you know, is to get people to do things spontaneously without thinking, because that's when the real you shows up. That's when the energy comes alive. And when you do that, when you start to connect to your true nature, suddenly there's energy available for you to set a higher standard for what you want in your life. That's what this is really all about. And when I talk about standards, when I talk about, you know, shoulds versus musts, think about your own life. I know there have been areas in your life where some point in time you just shifted and you raised the standard and your life changed. Because whatever people have their identity attached to, they live. We live who we believe we are. That's just how it works. It's just kind of like, I'll give you an example. Look at your physical body. Your physical body today is an absolute reflection of only one thing. Not your goals, not your desires, but your standards. The identity you have for yourself. If your standard is you're an athlete, then there's a certain amount of strength, a muscle tone, and energy that's available in your body on a regular basis because that's who you are. And so you do whatever is necessary to maintain that identity. Again, the strongest force in the human personality is this need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. Because if you don't know who you are, you wouldn't know how to act. Once you lock in on that identity, your brain finds a way to keep you there. If you say, uh, you know, man, I've, I'm overweight, I've always been overweight, I'm big boned, and that's the story you've got, then you're going to always find a way to get back there. That's your settling point. That's your identity. That's where things lock in. If you see somebody who's in really great shape, you ask them, do you work out? You know the answer. Yes, how often? And they'll tell you three times, four times, five times a week, whatever. In a seminar, I'll ask people, who here works out at least five days a week? And I'm stand up. And you look around that room, and you know that they work out five times a week because you can see their body. You don't just get a result without some kind of action, without some form of ritual. Ritual meaning actions you do consistently. Now, do you think those people that are out there working out five days a week, do they have more time than you do? Or I have, or anybody else? Of course not. Is their life less busy? Of course not. It's just a must for them. They must work out that way, and they've made that turn, and their life changed. So I'm not saying you have to work out five days a week. I'm just saying whatever you really want, wants don't get met consistently. Standards do. Whatever you identify, this is who I am. And so it's not so much about changing your identity as there's expanding it. You know, deciding that, you know, instead of your goal is to lose 10 pounds, which is not compelling, what if your vision was to get back to my fighting weight? You know, this, this year, this month, this next 90 days, I'm going to transform my body. I'm going to take on a new challenge. I'm going to find some technique or strategy. There's a million of them that can reframe myself where I'm going to feel younger, stronger, more vibrant than ever before. Here's my reasons. Because I want the energy to really make my life work. Because it's tough out there and I want to be stronger than I've ever been before. I want to go in front of the mirror and if I'm naked, not, you know, want to laugh. I want to look there and take a good look and go, yeah basics that if you start start to shift it everything else will shift in your life as well some people by the way have to have more than enough money to do what they want when they want where they want with whomever they want contribute the way they want and if that's their must they find a way I know that sounds overly simplistic but it's true you know somebody once said you can take all the money in the world out of the hands of everybody out of all the wealthy people in the world who are really successful give it to other people it wouldn't take too long those people would have it back in their hands it's not because they're manipulative it's because they have a standard some are manipulative don't get me wrong but they got a standard of what they're going to find a way to make happen i'm just simply saying to you take those three magic words and live them raise your standard and if you really want to do it then i'll tell you the most important secret have you ever done this have you ever told yourself you're raising your standard? Okay, I'm gonna go make this happen. I'm gonna go make this much money. I'm gonna transform my kids. I'm gonna create the ultimate relationship in my life. I'm gonna transform my body, whatever it is. And then you don't have strong enough reasons and you don't lose, use it. You don't follow through. It's because you didn't back up your standards with what makes those standards real. And that's rituals. Rituals are where the power is. Whenever we do our Robin's results coaching, you know, we say Robin's equals results, the way we get results with people, it's the same way if you listen to uh, my Ultimate Edge program or back in the old days, Personal Power, or if you went to one of my seminars, you know what I do is I take these huge challenges you got and we break them down into little bite-sized steps. Little things you do each day that after you do them, you get so much momentum that it's easy to succeed. You're not overwhelmed. You have these victory day after day after day on little things. 
If you went through Ultimate Edge, I'm sure you learned about the hour of power or the 15 minutes to be able to be fulfilled or 30 minutes to thrive where you literally just condition your body and emotion with a couple little rituals. So it doesn't matter what's going on in your world, you feel that strength and it's not fake, it's not some pump up, it's coming from inside you and it works. Rituals define us. See, all the results in your life are coming from your rituals. They start with a standard and then have rituals that follow it up. Like for example, if you are where you want to be physically, you have very different rituals than if you're not where you want to be physically. If you're overweight, you and I both know you got a different ritual than if you're physically fit. Completely different. You get up in the morning, what's the first thing you do if you're fit? Your shoes are there, you roll over, doesn't matter how you feel, you put on your shoes, you lace them, you start walking or whatever that ritual is. If you're overweight, you roll over and you have a very different ritual. You might roll over several times to turn the alarm clock off. You go in and get your mocha, smoka, whatever, you know, special coffee. You stop by at Starbucks, whatever the case may be. You have your nice sugar muffin, you know, that's supposed to be really nice for you. Whatever you do, it's a different ritual. If you have a great, passionate relationship, you have very different rituals in how you come home than if you have a lousy relationship. When you come home and the first thing you do is you're tweeting somebody or you're emailing or flipping on the news or you don't even come home. And what are the rituals? Whenever I study people that are successful, what I look for is what's the standard they hold themselves to? And then what are all those little rituals that up? Because think about it. Success and failure are not giant events. They don't just show up. You don't just suddenly become successful or suddenly have this cataclysmic event that makes you fail. It may look that way, but failure comes from all the little things. It's failure to make the call. It's failure to check the books. It's failure to say, I'm sorry. It's failure to push yourself to do things physically that you don't want to do. And all those little failures day after day come together until one day some cataclysmic event happens and you blame that. That event happened because you missed all the little stuff. Do you agree with me? And success, by the way, is not some overnight event. It's all these little things. Success is having a vision. Success is making it compelling. Success is really seeing it and feeling it every day with strong enough reasons. Success is feeling the sense that I'm here to grow and I'm here to give something to the world more than just myself. Success is caring about other people. Success is calling and saying I love you in the middle of the day for no damn reason or sending a note. That'll change your relationship. Have a ritual of something funny, playful, or a surprise you do. How many relationships are dead today because they have no surprise rituals anymore? You need to have some rituals, some cool things you do that nobody else does that gives you a better life than anybody else has. All the little stuff, that's where success comes from. In business, it comes from delivering more than anybody could imagine. All those little things add up, people go, wow, that's who I want to do business with. It's true in any area of your life. So if you look at somebody who's really successful and you think, wow, I mean, they're, they're so amazing, they're such a genius, you gotta dig underneath and you gotta remember something. People are rewarded in public for what they've practiced for years in private. Myself and my business people say, how do you get up and speak and you have no notes and you go for three days and nights and the room is like, everybody's wired and it's incredible, it's like a rock concert. How do you do that? How do you have that confidence? Oh, and you know, it's not confidence, it's experience now but I did so much behind the scenes and I still do to make things right. I mean, how many people would know that since the time I was 17 years old, before I walk out on stage, still do to this day, wouldn't need to do it, but I still do it. I never walk out there without being in an absolute peak state of mind. You know, there are days my back is hurting, my throat is hurting, or I may have had a challenge, or my father passed away, and I've still got to deliver for these people because my standard is give my all every time. Every event has to be better. Talk to anybody who's been to our events for five, 10 years, some of our trainers, and I'll say, I don't know how he does it. He always finds a way to make it better. That's not an ego thing. That's a standard in me. I have to find the way. And my ritual though is I prepare, I think, I gather new information. I figure out how to put something across better. What do people need? I spend time with our customers. I see what's going on. And before I get on stage each time, I have this little ritual to put myself in a state of mind. And I did it starting like 17 years old. I started doing it. I'd say, I now command my subconscious mind. And I say this out loud several times, this little phrase, set of phrases, as an incantation to kind of condition my mind and body. And I'd say, I now command my subconscious mind to direct me in helping as many people as possible today by giving me the strength and the emotion and the humor and the brevity, whatever it takes to show this person and help this person change their life now. And I started that with a person when I worked with people one-on-one, -on -one, and I would do that for 45 minutes driving in my Volkswagen to go serve and coach somebody for the first time. 
Now I don't say that person, I say these people, and I can go out in the room of 10,000 people and deliver for 50 hours, and I do it every time I come back on stage. It's a ritual, a ritual to go into peak state. Peak states don't just show up, they don't interrupt you. Great ideas don't interrupt you, you gotta pursue them. I talked to Michael Jordan, I'll never forget, at the peak of his career, and got to watch his final game. Saw him backstage and spent some time with him, and it was a pretty exciting time. He was the greatest basketball player I think that ever lived and has ever lived. And I asked him, I said, you know, what sets you apart, Michael? You know, what is it? And is it God-given talent, ability, skill? What is it? And he said, Tony, you know, he said, I can shoot you straight. And you know, it's not, you know, me trying to act humble. He goes, I have a lot of talent, a lot of God-given talent, a lot of skill. I've worked really hard. But he said, really, it's my standards. He said, every day I demand more from myself than anybody else could humanly expect. I'm not competing with somebody else. I'm competing with what I'm capable of. Hmm. Magic formula. Because most of us lower our standards, why? Because who you spend time with, my friends, is who you become. One of the biggest reasons I started going to seminars when I was like 17 is I had nobody around me as a great role model. I could read about somebody, but being around people, being in that environment was very different. Finding a way to go to work with someone who lived that standard of life was very different. You get around people with low standards and you compete with it, you don't need to compete with it. It's like, okay. I mean, remember Jerry Springer? I don't know if he's still in the air, but you know, I remember he used to get people on the show and I thought, where would he find these people? <laughs> and why would people watch? I'll tell you why they watch. They watch these people and go, my life's still pretty darn good compared to that person. Look at them. You don't have to change your life. All you have to do is find somebody with a lower standard and you'll feel good about yourself. But if you feel that good feeling, it's an illusion. The only thing that's going to make you happy, man. Milliseconds, hundredth of a second, he pushed himself just beyond his competitor. But you know about Michael Phelps? What allowed him to be able to push beyond that moment is his rituals. Go study the guy. Most people who swim have these unbelievable workouts. He does two and three of those workout sessions a day. All the other swimmers in the beginning thought he was insane. You can overtrain, you can't do that. It's not physically possible. But he had a standard and the rituals to back it up. So here's my final message to you because I've gotten carried away. I thought I was going to send you like a five minute message, but as you can see there's no script here. It's just me going a little crazy with you, but I want to really see you get what you want this year. Don't let this year be like last. And if last year was great, still don't let it be that way. Raise the standard. If your life is perfect and extraordinary, you darn well know you're not going to be happy unless you keep making it better. That's what makes us feel alive. It's not what we get that makes us happy. It's who we become and what we're able to give because we become more. That sense of contribution is what creates the deepest meaning. So here's my assignment for if you want one. If you want to go from conversation to some action, here's a simple thing to do. What's an area of your life right now that you really want to improve? What's an area that's important to improve? If your body's great, how about your career? If career's great, how about your relationships? Intimate one especially, or your kids, or your relationship with your creator, your spiritual side of your life, or is it your finances? Figure an area that really matters. Decide on that area. Number one. Write down what your life is like in that area right now as specifically as possible. So you might say, well, I'm 13.5 pounds overweight, <laughs> you know, whatever the weight is, whatever the situation is, or my body fat's like this, or I'm I wake up exhausted in the morning, and you write the truth of where you are right now, so you're real clear. Or I'm not in a relationship, I say I want a relationship, but I, I'm not in one, and I don't seem to find them, all the good ones seem to be gone is my belief. You know, and I, and I really do want one, but I don't have it. Whatever your definition, I'm in a relationship and God, I wish I wasn't in a relationship. <laughs> I'm planning my escape, wherever you are. Or I have a lo wonderful relationship, we love each other, but there just isn't enough passion. Just write the truth of where you are. The area you want to change, but write how it is. And then the second step is, this is where you gotta be really honest with yourself. What are the rituals that have put me there? Because whatever results you're getting, even if you don't like the results, there's some rituals that are keeping you in that place. There's some rituals of what you eat or don't eat, how you move or don't move, how you sleep or don't sleep. There's some rituals in the lack of variety or spice or energy or focus in an area. There's something you're doing, and it's usually not one thing, it's a bunch of little things that you kind of do consistently whenever you think about getting in a relationship, whenever you think about working out, whenever you think about money, you get yourself in a state of overwhelm. You start thinking about all the things you can't control. Just write down all the rituals you have, and then here's the third step. What do you want? What's your vision? And be really specific. I want to be my fighting weight. I want to be the strongest I've ever felt. I want to be, I'm going to turn my, whatever it is, be specific. And then, last step number four, what are the rituals that'll get you there? What would you need to do differently each morning if you're going to be that kind of energy, that kind of strength? How would you have to, how often would you work out? What days would you work out? What time? 
A ritual is something you do consistently, usually at a specific time, so it becomes automatic.